Great. Hi there, and welcome back to our LinkedIn Live series on human first CEOs. My name is Nick Maida, and I'm the CEO of Gainsight. And I'm really excited to continue this conversation about how we think leadership is changing and evolving radically in this world where we're not just thinking about the bottom line from a shareholder perspective, but are thinking about all of our stakeholders as human beings. And so super excited today to continue the conversation with one of my favorite CEOs in the world, Rachel Carlson, a CEO of Guild Education. Welcome, Rachel. Oh, I think you're muted, Rachel. Uh, let me see. If, uh, Sorry, that was, I feel like that will be the, the memoir of 2020 was your yeah. So there we go. Sorry about that. We had to have one of those to prove that this is real and live. So, but it's, it's great having you here. And I'm so excited. I think both of us think a lot alike about this sort of human first concept and uh, excited to have a good conversation together. We're going to talk about a lot of different things, but first I want the audience just get a little vignette into you on the personal side. So my icebreaker question is, we're all quarantined at home and you, I'm sure you've been at home just like all of us have. What's the, if you could pick a, a person, a celebrity, past, present, future that you can be quarantined with, who would you choose? Uh, my answer to that is almost always Oprah, and that is still my answer. I think she'd be delightful to spend long periods of time with. But given also what's going on in the world, I think I'd also want Brene Brown to come for breakfast every morning. <laughs> like uh, pump up, meditation, center yourself for the day, breakfast convening. Oh, that is amazing. Oh, that's Oprah and Brene Brown. I think you would come out a very, an even more developed person than you already are. What's yours? My, I choose, I, it changes by the week. There's so many. I, I think I would like comedy. So I think Will Ferrell at home would be just like a constant entertainment, uh, perhaps some chaos too, but I think that would be good Good for all of us to have a little little bit of humor. I like that. I'd want him to bring that little girl from his Pearl the Landlord videos so you can oh, yes. have all the kids around the whole time. Oh my God. And hopefully not swear to my kids too much. We'll see. Uh, but, although I guess they'll learn, they have to learn eventually. So we're going to talk about human first and the way we think about it is treating all your stakeholders as human beings, the community around you, your teammates and their families, your customers, and obviously your shareholders as well. But think about the, all the stakeholders. I want to start with community because right now this is the year where leaders can't live in a vacuum. You know, we live in the world that's either healthy or not, that's either, you know, just or not. And we have to fit into that world and hopefully make it better. On March 14th, I remember you sending me an email and me and a bunch of other CEOs and it's funny because it, I don't, everyone should think back to what you were doing on March 14th. I was trying to figure out how to properly wash my hands, figure out whether we had any masks at home or not, trying to understand like how we were going to do DoorDash at home. And meanwhile, Rachel was trying to figure out how to stop the spread. Rachel started an organization, I'll let her describe it, called Stop the Spread to try to get CEOs mobilized initially to basically get all of us to do our part to get our employees back to home. And I'd love you to tell, tell the audience a little bit the story of Stop the Spread, how you came up with it and, and what it evolved into. Yeah, it was, it was sort of the craziest accident I've ever experienced. And I joked with our board, it's like you find product market fit on something you really didn't want to find product market fit on. But what happened was Ken Chenault, board member of mine, who was in New York and I was in Denver, we were talking over that weekend about what was going on and felt like our business leaders were more activated than our government leaders because they were trying to figure out what to do. And so we said like, why don't we write a letter and email the CEOs we know and see if maybe we all shut our businesses down, if that might catalyze social distancing and getting some changes. Cause here in Colorado, our ski resorts were still open. There was a 14,000 person conference the night or concert the night before. Wow. So we wrote this letter and then um, it ended up, they, the New York Times asked us to elaborate on it and, uh, and write an op-ed. And what ended up happening was I had reached out to all these tech CEOs. He knew all the Fortune 500 CEOs. And we started matchmaking people who wanted to do more than just shut down their businesses. So we helped General Motors connect with Ventec, a ventilator startup. And that catalyzed the first production of ventilators here in the U.S. in a you know, innovative way to make sure we had enough for the spikes we saw in April. And then unfortunately that we're going to see again here now. And then it led to about 85 partnerships like that. And we were able to help produce 20 million extra pieces of PPE and thousands of, of ventilators that went around the country and, and now stop the spread, found a home and uh, impact assets, a larger fund. So now Ken and I are just on speed dial when we can be helpful, but it, it turned into something much greater than what we imagined from the letter. Well, that's amazing because I'm guessing you were not a ventilator expert before you started the organization, right? And, Just the least. 
<laughs> and it, it shows, I think it shows that all of us can do so much more than we maybe even can imagine around our community and helping folks around us, you know, hope, hopefully not just in times of crisis, but even on a day to day basis. And that's a good segue to th something I think that's just deep in Guild's mission about the fact that so many people putting aside the current economy are not trained for the new generation of work that's out there. A lot of people don't have college degrees, haven't been trained on new skills and new technologies. And Guild Education is all about helping to solve that problem. So maybe you can talk a little bit about founding Guild and kind of the mission behind it, besides that it's a great business. Sure. Uh, so 88 million Americans in the US, which is more than half the workforce, uh, have to go back to school before they retire. And that's a stat we don't talk enough about because everyone thought four years of school, 40 years of work, done. Um, yeah. Now, um, you know, of the 88 million, 64 million never completed college. Another 24 million uh, maybe got a credential or certificate or a, started at a for-profit school, but never completed. And so what we set out to do was to help that population of Americans have the chance to go back to school. And when we started asking all the best smaller nonprofit and public schools in the country, why aren't you scaling? Why aren't you able to serve these students? They kept telling us two things, Google, Facebook, Google, Facebook, because the marketing costs were so high. And so my co-founder Britt and I started trying to figure out, okay, well, how do we better than match the best universities in the country, schools you've never heard of, like Bellevue University and Brandman, who have way higher graduation rates for working adults, for single moms, for Hispanic Americans, for really important demographics that get overlooked amidst the 18 year old. Um, and the answer was we had to help bypass Google and Facebook as marketing channels to bring the costs down for universities. So mm -hmm. we found that employers were willing to do that work with us. And so we thought of Fortune 1000 employers as a channel to get to know the 88 million Americans since so many of them work for the Fortune 1000. And along the way, the employers said, hey, we're also willing to pay for this education because we're seeing that it impacts our recruitment, our retention, our upskilling, and our employer brand as a place to work. And so we've now been able to, to move forward with that, but it all really started on my and Britt's prior experience in community colleges and working with students and realizing we were neglecting the working adult learner in the US. Yeah, I think the last time I saw you in person, uh, the CEO of Walmart was talking about using uh, Guild Education. So. I, uh, I, you, uh, you've built some big fans out there in the industry, and it's a great example of how kind of uh, community success can be built into a business model. We at Gainsight, we've seen this ourselves, but we were fortunate to partner with Guild Education on trying to help people go into the customer success field, because that's a, a field that has a lot of demand, and people that might have lost jobs in restaurants or hotels or airlines that have great customer service skills can come into this new field. Are there other fields like that that are just like rapidly growing and kind of looking for talent that you know we should point people to yeah absolutely i i keep saying you know if you turn on the tv right now everyone's talking about a v employment yeah. uh bounce or a U. um i think we're gonna have a w yeah and the reason i think that and that, that's scary it's not good it's i just think scary. the reality is i think this first phase we saw a lot of the displacement tied to the healthcare crisis and the economic crisis what everyone forgot about is there's also an automation uh, agenda yeah. coming. And when that comes, I think we're going to see a lot of roles shift away from the face to face jobs that we're already seeing get hurt by COVID into roles like logistics and shipping, financial services, quality assurance, Salesforce administration. And those are all paths like customer success that we should be pointing our our best consumer facing folks who today work in retail or hospitality or food service and helping them upscale into what I'd call like digital customer success roles. I love that. That's that's really amazing. And I think that's an opportunity for us to expand the funnel and you know, give more opportunity. But honestly, for us as employers also to get more talent because all of those jobs you listed, there's way less supply versus the demand for jobs out there. Absolutely. And, and what we think about all the time is how do you match competencies? And I know you guys are, are thinking about how do you help folks from underrepresented backgrounds get into customer success? So I, that was my, I know you're interviewing me, but that was my question for you today. I love it. No, it's, and it's, I, I think that, you know, we all saw, you know, with the murder of George, George Floyd and all the other things that happen every single day for black Americans in the U S we saw this tremendous racial injustice that we've lived with forever. It's not new. But I think finally society's waking up to it. Everyone's trying to say, how can we do our part? And one of the things that's true is in, in, the, in the industry we serve, customer success management, you, know, you have some of those in your company. There's th that role is heavily biased towards all the backgrounds that are in tech already, right? Which is great. You know, a lot of people in tech come from lots of privileged backgrounds, but 
the th truth is, truth is, people don't have access. They don't have access to get into tech. They don't have the access to get into customer success. Meanwhile, they could be great people. They could be great employees. And these tech companies are fighting over this very small population of privileged people. So we're all giving everyone raises and try to keep them and f struggling to retain them. And so we think there's an opportunity to have a real win-win where we can expand the pool of customer success people by creating an apprentice program where people can come from underrepresented backgrounds. We're going to be announcing it in a few weeks. Uh, we're partnering with some organizations that are experts at kind of the actual kind of mentorship and like getting people ready for work and all that. And then actually bring them in and then help um, through some of the work we've done together, help them get skilled up and then help them get into the employers because we work with a lot of companies that are hiring CSMs. So a very small way, I think we, you know, we, we're kind of measuring, how, can we actually look at what's the lifetime, the earnings that these people could have and the uplift in earnings that we could have in this population of people by putting them on a different path, you know? And I think that's a lot of what you do in, in general, Guild, is you help change the life, path of people's lives, which is, is really powerful. Thanks, yeah, well, the program sounds fantastic, and I hope some of our students get to get to be a part of that. Um, that'd be an awesome full circle. We're excited, yeah. And you know, it's a good segue, because I think that like, I read a quote from, from you, you said, CEOs today have an enor enormous influence on creating social influence in a positive way. And I think that's something CEOs didn't think about before, to be totally honest. Like not, you know, some CEOs did, but most didn't. And I think the world's changing. Like, how do you see it changing amongst the CEOs you talk to? Yeah, I mean, I think about this in the context of Guild, where we very consciously built uh, our business as a B Corp with a double bottom line business model. And we have the ability to do that. Our business functions such that we do well by doing good and do good by doing well. Um, and that's, uh, you know, really meaningful for us. But I, it also makes me think of a concept that Ken Chenault, my, the board member I already referred to, he taught me when he first invested in Guild. He said something that's not left me, which is that corporations exist with the permission of our society. And it's this idea that like the private sector has to operate within the constraints of our current society and that changes and evolves. And so I think like you look at the corporate changes that have been catalyzed by Black Lives Matter or the response of marketing orgs to boycotting Facebook right now. And I think you see some of the appropriate responsiveness. But I, I also think the part I, I think that's hard and you hear CEOs push back on sometimes, which is fair, is we, we still need good governance. We yeah. still need multi-sector collaboration. We can't ask the corporate sector to fix all of these issues. And that's actually a flawed strategy. And so making sure that we're finding the right balance between public, private, and nonprofit sectors working together. And Bill Gates always says this best, like his philanthropy is a drop in the bucket compared to the federal government budget. And we need to be sure that all of us who interact in this multi-sector economy are thinking about how to deploy capital and government and private sector to reflect the values of our country. That's amazing. And it's so, so well said. Yeah, you can't solve it just with one of the three. You need all of them together. So now, now as leaders, we also have to think about another stakeholder, which is our teammates internally and their families and kind of keeping that ecosystem going. And so I want to ask you some questions about that. While I do that, by the way, if folks have questions online live, you can type them into LinkedIn in the comments box and they'll get relayed to me magically and I'll ask them to Rachel. So one of the things we all dealt with is our employees working from home, right? That, and it's kind of, it's tired now because amazing we all adjusted so quickly. I know Guild did some stuff around stipends for working from home and kind of looking at your health insurance plans and all that, which is amazing. What are the things that you're wrestling with now as you think about like working from home going forward, which might be even longer than we all expected? Yeah, I think we're all feeling the kind of sadness of moving from the sprint, which felt like it could be driven by adrenaline. And you're right, we I, we did things that are, I'm really proud I didn't lead. Our people team led around uh, like giving everyone a stipend to refurbish their house, to work from home, and then re reopening our healthcare plan so anyone with a high deductible could revert. That was really meaningful. I'm glad we did it. We're now in the marathon phase and we're trying to figure that out. And I, I don't think we have all the answers yet. I mean, we're trying to stay connected as best we can. And, and we've made a lot of progress there, but we also went forward with an acquisition, our first, and then a big product launch. And that made things harder and it was the right call, but it's been really hard to, we've added 200 employees who've never met each other in this period. Um, and that's been difficult. So I'm really proud of our team for being resilient during that time. And it's helped us serve our students and our employees really well, but our team has made a sacrifice on that dimension. And so I think we're a tight knit operation and we're so eager to get back to being able to see each other, but I think we're gonna be patient and, and figure out how to ride it out. Yeah, it's so well said about the marathon. I think we all, I probably, you and I are probably similar. I, I approach everything like a sprint, like energy, just go, go, go. And eventually you're like, okay, well we need to, we're gonna burn ourselves out really quickly. 
Um, but at the same time, we don't want to take our foot off the gas for the visions we all have in our companies. And I, I struggle with that a little bit of like wanting to be empathetic and let people have that space and understand their life situations are really challenging. And at the same time, wanting to keep going with our business. So I think we're all kind of navigating that uh, at the best we can. One, one of the things that we've all de also dealt with, and I mentioned it before, is the impact of Black Lives Matter and the discussion that we're all having, rightfully so, internally. And you, you kind of made some commitments at Guild Education about how you're thinking about kind of racial justice inside of your company. You, you wanna share what you, what you kind of came up with? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I want to be clear, like we're on a learning journey here. We are really far from the end destination and we have a lot of work to do at Guild. What we were able to do from team feedback at the at the very beginning of this conversation, which candidly should have been happening for many, many Same. years. So yeah. I want to acknowledge that, but grateful that the social climate has forced us all to sit up straight and have this conversation. You know, we we did things like um, giving all of our employees five days off to to volunteer and support community efforts that attack inequality. If that was something they wanted to pursue, we asked that every employee take a stipend to buy a book. We're big readers and learners at Guild that would educate them more on topics related to racial injustice, like how to be an anti-racist. Yeah. Um, and then uh, we also did a, a donation drive to to five various organizations like Black Lives Matter and NAACP Legal Fund. Um, but that's step one. And I think step two is looking really internally. For example, we don't um, have the racial composition of our employee base that reflects our student base right now. And we have some hard work to do on that. And, um, you know, we've done a great job at Guild by having a lot of female leaders and, and yeah. being uh, you know, accomplishing other types of diversity, but we really have work to do on other areas. And so the only thing I'm trying to do is just have the honest conversation and admit where there's hard work to do and learn. I love that. I love all the, everything you said, especially because you're, you're right that your student base probably reflects a very different demographic profile than the tech employees that many of us have in our companies, right? It reflects probably more of like America more broadly, right? And, and the world more broadly. It's almost identical to the American uh, population in our student base, um, which is quite cool and means we've got to work to to move closer towards that. And I and I and we love learning too. And obviously it's part of your mission and we're all soaking up all the great information. I'm reading how to be anti-racist right now. And a lot, there's so much, so much we can all learn here. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I read recently your blog post about the world needing human first CEOs and moving away from this idea of wartime CEOs. And it really impacted my perspective because I remember when COVID came out, I was like, okay, be a wartime CEO. We were, we were all told this is what we were supposed to do. We read Ben's book, like we're ready to go. Um, so how are you practicing that? And what advice do you have for me and others? Yeah. So, you know, for people in context, if you haven't read the blog post, I talked about the idea that there's this concept called wartime CEO. And by the way, there's a lot of good in the in that original concept it came from Ben Horowitz. He wrote a book called The Hard Thing About Hard Things. And the concept is that, you know, when you're running a company in smooth waters, it's very different than when you're running a company going through turbulent times. And I think you have to adjust. But I do think that some CEOs take the wartime concept a, a little too far and almost make an excuse to kind of dehumanize business. Uh, and, you know, this is where you hear people talking about trimming the fat and, you know, kind of like talk about, you know, just kind of getting a little bit more lean without understanding the human impact. By the way, sometimes people do have to do layoffs. Sometimes they have to do things that don't aren't great for their customers, but to dehumanize it, to treat it like they're not human beings. That's the thing I have a hard time with. And what I'm really excited about, and honestly, you are truly an inspiration around this is a new crop of CEOs um, who are saying, look, everyone around me, my customers, my employees, their families, community. It's just a bunch of human beings. And like you like Kenneth Chenault said, like we, a business exists, we said, I think with the permission of society, like we're, we exist here as part of a larger ecosystem. And so I'm seeing that a lot. And then for me personally, what that means in running Gainsight, and so this is always our purpose as we talk about as a company is be living proof you can win in business while being human first. So we believe that for years. And what that forces me to do every time we're making decision is kind of think about, okay, what does this mean for our employees? What does this mean for their families? What's this mean for our, our investors? What's it mean for our customers? And and not just like in a generic sense, like the customer isn't GE, the customer is this person at GE, right? And almost visualizing them and visualizing like the impact. Now that doesn't mean you don't make hard decisions. I think you and I have to make tons of hard decisions, but at least you're thinking about the stakeholders when you make them. And hopefully we make more human decisions in the process. I love that. That's so valuable. And 
it, uh, I think it's really useful too within the context of mission driven businesses, making sure that your mission points inward. And I think in early days of a startup, when you're not sure if your business is going to make it, it's really scary. And I don't think I always thought about that because I was just making sure we stayed alive. And That's so. Right. For yeah. the first three years, keeping the business alive was priority number one. I'm now trying to revert and think about, okay, what's the sustainable path? What do we have to change about our employee experience so that we can all be on a marathon together? Yeah, you know what's interesting is that I think that's a core part of it. In the early days, I do think there's an element of you got to be alive and survive. But eventually, like, I think we have to recognize we have real businesses now. And, and our job is to, like, actually do something good with them for all our stakeholders. You know, and I think that's a good segue because when we talk about customer success, which I'm contractually obligated to talk about in every every session. Um, the, the thing that's amazing about, I think, your business is you have different kinds of customers. You've got your corporate employers, you've got the, the education institutions, universities, and so on, and you've got these students. And like, how do you think about all of those as customers and kind of building this almost like a, it seems like almost like a virtuous cycle between them all? Yeah, we've always talked about it as alignment between the three stakeholders, student being our end customer, and that's really important and, and an important focal point, but we don't have any end customers if we don't work with employers because the only way we make our whole ecosystem work is by cutting Google and Facebook out of the equation and having the employer be our acquisition channel. And so we've done a ton of work around incentive alignment and making sure that for the employer, they're benefiting because of their recruitment, their retention, their employee brand, et cetera that our students are benefiting because we're unlocking economic opportunity for them, which has always been goal number one. And that our universities who really function like our supply side, you know, mm -hmm. if they were a grocery store, they're, they're who puts the products on the shelf, um, that they're benefiting. And, and for them, it's benefiting access to high quality students who they couldn't get to know otherwise, who don't live in their communities and benefiting from higher retention rates and higher quality experiences because our students aren't taking on debt. And the number one reason why people drop out of school is because of the finances and the debt. And so we've been able to improve retention rates for those schools. Um, but we're always working on it. You're titrating those three stakeholder component parts at all times and trade-offs are real. And we have to talk about those all the time at Guild. That's interesting. Yeah, an entrepreneur texted me the other day and he had a similar situation. He had three parts of his market and he said, which one is the customer? And it sounds like your answer is yes, all of them, right? Like there's not a, one of them is not the customer over the other. All three need to be successful. Is, is that a good way to sum it up? Yeah, we, we just say you, they all have to be partners and you have to balance and, and adjust. And really every quarter we think about, OK, where where are the resources going? How is engineering supporting one versus the other? How are our various services and teams influencing? And there have been times where it's gotten out of whack and then we have to adjust. That's amazing. That's that's really, I think, very relevant. Now, a lot of people in customer success have also had to just figure out how do they adjust to their customers new world of COVID-19? What, how has COVID-19 changed the world of this tri triangle ecosystem for your customers? Oh my gosh, it's changed so much. We're a really relationally driven company and we spent a lot of time on site with our customers in early days and as of late. And so that's felt crazy that we can't fly to Bentonville, which felt like second home for many of us as we were building Walmart or the fun places to visit Disney, uh, you know, have Disney on Earth on the left and the right coasts. Um, but for us, it, that's been one thing shifting to the employer relationship. Luckily for us, the student relationship has always been digital. We've always worked with our students remotely so that we could serve any student in any corner of the United States. Um, and so that team has been there. But COVID has had a wild and disproportionate impact on our students. Right. So COVID has really disproportionately impacted low income communities, communities of color, rural communities and young adults, which all four are major populations in Guild student base. And so our coaches who are our, you know, customer success managers have had a massive, massive challenge ahead of them in supporting their students and their students families during crisis. Yeah, I can imagine that's yeah, that's it's a lot of I think every leader, every participant in business now has to think about the, the human story behind each person they're talking to now and how much they're dealing with. Now the flip side on the on the the last stakeholder is, is our investors and you have great investors. We share some investors and we think they're great, especially if they're listening right now. Um and uh they but I think you know you've also shown how you can build a very unique business model, right? This isn't your classic software business model where you build software you sell to one company. You have a model where you're thinking about all these stakeholders and kind of building a business off all that. Talk a little about how you designed this business model uh, and sort of why it's been so successful. 
Yeah, it's it's funny looking back. I don't think we knew we were designing a creative business model. I think we just thought we were putting the puzzle pieces together to solve the problem. But but then once we started pitching to investors there who kind of told us like, this is pretty creative or unique or different. I don't know if those were compliments or concerns at the time. <laughs> you know, sometimes there's a, a, a liking to the simplest business model possible. But for us, it's meant we've been able to ideally on our best days practice compassionate capitalism or, or stakeholder capital which you know we all need to act on that's a that's a phrase that's been said a lot in the last couple of years and i think if we can all like lean into acting it we can really prove that it works and i think there's never been a more important time because our political and economic systems in the united states are highly integrated i was just on a slack channel with a bunch of friends talking about that in other countries economic and political actually sit further apart and, and move at different paces mm -hmm. but here in the u.s the woes of capitalism get really tied into the woes of our political system. And for us to improve both, I really think we have to figure out a new brand of compassionate capitalism for it to work. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, whether you call it compassionate capitalism or stakeholder capitalism or the human first idea, I do think it's it's calling on something different. And one thing I note is your design of your business model fundamentally just fits that because your business model is designed around a kind of success for all it you only succeed if the students are succeeding and the employers are succeeding and the universities are succeeding in this sort of triangle together. And if you're watching, I think that's a big part of business in the future is not just caring about it, but designing it into your business model for what you do going forward. So last question I have for you, Rachel, uh, you know, we, we go meet a lot of CEOs. You and I were in a lot of events together. Do you, do you think this is a temporary change? You know, people being more concerned about human first and community and justice, or are we going to be able to, get people to believe in this long term i i think we're on a long-term path now what i don't know is if we're going to see the immediate rewards to all the companies doing the right thing but i do think we are seeing some of the pains of the companies who don't focus mm -hmm. on a stakeholder or compassionate capitalism perspective and so i you know i'm like I, I have to believe it because it's too deep in my bones to my, my only place I know I have in business is if I can find business models that do well by doing good. And otherwise we almost started Guild as a nonprofit. We were only going to do this if we felt like it was aligned. And wow. so I, I'm confident there's enough other businesses like Gainsight out there where if we can keep trotting along on the marathon, enough of us will start showing the getting to the finish line or showing others what it looks like. So excited to be on the road with you. Same here. It's awesome being this, in this race together. I think it is really for, for good. So thanks so much for being an inspiration to us and to a lot of people watching as well. Really appreciate all you do, Rachel. Thanks so much for having me. This was awesome. Okay. See ya.